is a sailor and uh, he is alcoholic. He's an alcoholic. A problem with alcohol. And he's from, he's from Polish, okay. by origin. And wants Arthur to be a sailor too, but Arthur don't want uh, this. And uh, Lucille, uh, they both are uh, in the age of childhood, between uh, childhood and adolescence. And they are, okay. And uh, Lucille um, discover at the same time she discover her body, she discover that she's disgusting by her body and she become anorexic. It's, the, the, it's a part of the book. And um, it's a kind of drama, and at the, um, a very dramatic point, they, met each, they meet each other, and so um, they decide to, um, to get away, to mm -hmm. uh, to, flee. to flee, and uh, they go into Italia. Yeah. Italy. Italy, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so good. Maud, I'm going away. They're letting me go home. She's being released from the hospital. I'm fat again, I guess. All I have to do now is lose what they made me put back on. You know, Maud, I won't forget you. I'll come see you often. Promise me you'll take care of yourself, okay? In an old photo, a skinny little girl strikes a dancer's pose. Was it Maud? Do skinny girls go to heaven? Lucille, set the table. Dinner will be ready soon. I would have liked to be a dancer. Really? What more grace, what's more graceful than a dancer? I don't know, a bird? A bird? Well, you're right, a bird. Oh, you. This is how the days go by. I'm lying down and I hurt. I can't stand contact between my limbs and my body, bone against bone. My mother thought we'd finally be able to share moments at meals. Poor woman, she's so pissed off. I definitely don't have breasts anymore. Two sad, empty bags. They disgust me. They were rather pretty, I think. I never let a man touch them before. No man will want to. I remember the summer, as a chubby kid, when I realized my body type. We'd gone to the lake with a few friends. The boys were playing with a ball. After a while, they started aiming it at the girls. When it hit one of them, they'd say they had the right to dunk her. But they weren't really dunking her. They were feeling her up. That was when I understood that the ball would never hit me. I wanted to hide myself completely from view. Happy birthday, honey. I'll name you Linda. Linda, slender and beautiful. Slender as a thread. Oh, how beautiful you are. I took that doll with me everywhere. At night, I pray with her that one day I'd be beautiful too. <clears throat> For years, she stayed by my side. Then one day, I put her away in a trunk in the attic. I didn't need her anymore. I'd become Linda, slender Linda, slender as a thread, minus the beauty. Wasn't I thin enough that I had to get thinner? I refuse all meals. My mother seems more worried than I am. I just don't get it, she says. She says if it's attention I want, I've got it. But I think what I want is to be so thin my body becomes non-existent, invisible. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, Ludwig, was uh, you, you were saying that improvisation is actually part of how you create uh, your work. And
And I was curious, what, what do you mean by improvisation? Is it something in your imagination, the plot line, or do you actually mean improvisation with pen on paper, the, the very images you start playing with and then the story comes out of what you're sketching? I mean, improvisation is like um, maybe jazz playing. I play jazz also with guitar, and, uh, you know, improvisation is the main part of jazz music. And um, every book I made, I start without, um, sans savoir quelle va, quelle va être la suite. Mm -hmm. Without knowing what's going to come next. And for example, uh, the, be the, the beginning of Lucille, she's just uh, walking around uh, on a cliff, sur une falaise, mm -hmm. and um, it's a symbol, c'est le, le fait qu'elle uh, voyage, qu'elle prenne un chemin, c'est comme pour moi la conscience de prendre un chemin dans ma tête et d'avancer dans l'histoire. So at this point, I don't know who is Lucille, what she's thinking and what she's doing to do in, in the book. And I'm waiting uh, to hear to hear her voice in my mind, and then she's beginning begin to to tell me the story, and um, it's very important for me to to feel her uh, more and more. So um, the thing that is very important for me with improvisation is that I don't want to. Um, uh, fix to freeze the um, the story because uh, for writing such a graphic novel it's maybe about uh, 500 pages it takes it takes uh, ça m'a ça m'a pris cinq ans but it took me five years to do so five years so uh, a lot of things happened in my life during those five years and if I freeze the the story at the beginning. As um, it's, it, c'est la coutume dans la bande dessinée de, de faire uh, un layout, un, de, 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 de faire une, un scénario très figé au départ et ensuite de le dessiner. So, for example, the frame, um, a, a man I know. Uh, uh, un auteur de bande dessinée. Um, um, a, um, yeah. a gentleman who does um, cartoons. Um, he was in a, a creative process with a book, with a comics book. And then, uh, in his real life, he lost uh, a, a friend of him, very close. He was very, very sad. And he said in an, in an interview, uh, I didn't want that nobody can see my um, my tristesse, my, my sadness, my sadness in the story. Maybe it was. C'était presque pour lui comme uh, un échappatoire uh, de pouvoir écrire. Yeah. For him, it was almost like a, a, a venting, um, a way that he could uh, could could void himself of his sadness. And for me, it's exactly the opposite. If <laughs> something like like that, so dramatic, or may, maybe so something happy happens and change my vision of life, I would like to put this in the story. And uh, for example, the problem with comics is that if you have one day to make a sequence uh, funny, and if these days you are not funny, for me it's very difficult. So improvisation authorizes myself to be more freely with this. And uh, that's what I mean with improvisation. Thank you. No, that's very interesting. Um, I actually want to even ask you a little bit somewhat of the same question, although clearly it's a, it's a different kind of process. But what stood out for me in what you said is that Lucille told you the story. You were, you were waiting for her to, to, un, to reveal the story. And both of you have very um, intimate characters and not many characters. There's really two main characters and the parents. And you, you really have a husband and wife, and that's, that's it. So I can imagine even more so than other writers, you would be very intimate with your characters because 
those are the ones. <laughs> um, did you have the same experience that that your the the the, the woman was revealing the, some of the story to you? Uh, this was the first first thing I wrote. So I was I thought that a novel starts here and ends here. So what, what she was doing and how it was going to end, I knew that on beforehand. But so what changed? I wrote it several times, but what changed was the language, and that got better. I understood that a literary language is something else than yeah. But and in the beginning, I insisted on her not being like me at all. Mm. But when I stopped insisting on that, then things became much easier to, yeah, yeah. So secretly you're an old woman living alone with green carpet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, do you mind just telling a little bit about how you came to writing? You were a computer engineer, or you were going to be, Yeah. and then... <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of statistics in her book. It's kind of remarkable. You know, you even saw in the passage that she read that uh, the, the the statistics of when you could, of the probability of being struck by lightning twice or that kind of thing. There's these games that get kind of played out. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about how you came to writing? Because it's an unusual way. <laughs> yeah, I didn't plan to write at all. I, my plan was to be a computer engineer. Uh, but life doesn't always turn out like we planned, fortunately. So uh, I had to quit my studies because I got ill. And then I decided to write this book. And, but like you said, I put some math and statistics and things into the book. So the education wasn't a total waste. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, she got a few good paragraphs <laughs> all those years. <laughs> yeah. And it's... And you don't have to know a lot of math or anything to to understand the book. And uh, yeah, and I hadn't read a lot of books either. Uh, but I think that both math and physics aren't that different from trying to write because it's just about trying to understand how the world works in some way. So I liked my engineering studies and physics and trying to figure out something. And I think that's the same thing I do when I'm writing, trying to understand something about this confusing world. Yeah. Not that I know any more now, but <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you got ill, yeah. and you sort of stepped away from the world, and that's when the idea of writing about loneliness, and in fact some of your own loneliness, began. Is that yeah, correct? yeah, and it changes your way of thinking when you just can, when you can't do anything, and when you're just inside, and when you're outside in the world and things are happening all the time, it's just easy not to think. And but when you're alone all day, and then you're sort of, it comes natural, I think. And so everyone asks why I've written about an old woman, since I'm not an old person myself yet, but. You can feel it old, even though you're young, and that's the good thing about literature. You can write about anything, and I think that loneliness and everyone are, is going to die, so uh, it's sort of a common thing, even though you're not an old woman yourself. And it's not the old women who write to me, it's the young men <laughs> who tell me that they feel exactly like her. Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. I mean, it's, it, it even goes back to what you were just saying about a cartoonist who has to write something funny and then something in their life affects them and they can choose to have it affect their work or use their work as an escape from the thing that is happening in their life. And you allowed it to affect your work, but almost in a one-to-one -one relation. Another person going through the kind of loneliness you did might have wanted to write a very loud, boisterous, crowded novel to get away from it and yeah. to fill their imagination with all of that. Um, and but I think the, the humor of it is necessary because it wouldn't, it would be <coughs> impossible to have, yeah, to write about it if I wasn't able to laugh at the same time. Right, yeah. right. And it is a funny novel. I mean, your characters. Very funny and odd. <laughs> Very odd, yeah. Um, and, but then I sort of want to talk about that with you. 
uh, in many ways, do you feel that some of your own experiences, in what way did that five years play out in the novel, your own experiences that you put into it? Um, if you could say a little bit about that. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one that, you know, I had an anorexic sister and this is what happened to her, but what, what, what in terms of that you were going through sort of started directly in the novel? À quel point c'est mon expérience aussi, euh, vous avez vu le graphique ou... En fait, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé pendant ces, euh, ces cinq ans de composition du récit que vous avez en fait mmh. ah. When I began the, the story, I was uh, in a strange period of my life who, who, where I couldn't, no, I couldn't no more uh, write or draw. And, um, in fact, I was, uh, I was in couple with uh, a young girl who out of anorexia. I happened to be uh, involved at that time. I was uh, part of a couple. The young woman was just coming out of anorexia. <laughs> and um, it was very uh, intense and very sad at the same time. Very hard for me uh, to live with her and to hear about her story, her problems. It makes some echoes, this echo, yeah, echoes, it echoes uh, with my own life. Because uh, when I was a ch child, since uh, six, 16, uh, I had an um, eating disorder. And uh, though, so um, hearing all the stories and living with her um, disturbed me a lot. I think um, the reason why I... I write a story about uh, an anorexic girl is maybe a, a kind of way to talk about myself, maybe. But the first reason uh, was to understand my girlfriend and maybe to put out of me uh, what was um, so hard to, to live with. Um, so. Before that, I made uh, autobiographical uh, novels, graphic novels, called uh, My Name is Ludovic, and I, de manière très prétentieuse, j'avais appelé ça Ludologie. Oh. <laughs> and um, I uh, named it kind of field, uh, Ludology, which was uh, very pretentious. <laughs> and uh, inside this book, I tried to uh, explain who I am, and uh, for the whole world, they wanted the uh, old people uh, know what is my life, and uh, it was mostly f more funny than uh, Lucille. But the main problem I had with this book was the, um, the selfish and narcissistic one. Um, it's, it's very hard to, to get out in a real autobiographical um, uh, book for me, to get out from narcissism, even if I wasn't, uh, même si if, even if I was rude with me. Uh, même si j'étais très dur dans l'image que je donnais de moi-même, il uh -huh. y a toujours une, une idée narcissique qui en ressort. Even if I was very hard on myself in the, uh, in the image that I projected in the book of myself, that's still a narcissistic act. <laughs> and um, I was a little... Um, j'étais un peu enfermé par le, le, le mode de représentation autobiographique de devoir représenter les vraies personnes avec les vraies choses. Uh, and I was also... Uh, and uh, I thought it was very important to talk about my parents in this autobiographical book. But, for example, my, my father had a problem with alcohol, uh, alcoholic. Uh, alcoholic, he was an alcoholic. Alcoholic. It, in, really influenced my life, but I didn't think that it was possible to talk about that in his place and to decide for him to talk about his alcoholism. I didn't really think that it was uh, possible to talk about that in his place and to decide for him to talk about his alcoholism what he should be saying about his own alcoholism. So actually, I didn't talk about that, even if it was so important. So I think maybe the book is not a little bit of that. So maybe the book is kind of ruined because of that aspect. 
And but you put it in Lucille. Yes, in Lucille. yes. That's why I, I talk yeah. about that, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. yeah, because in, in Lucille, uh, I, the sailor has problem with alcohol, for example, and Lucille has problem with, um, with um, um, eating. And so maybe it's a kind of so main part of my life too. And uh, I can put fantasy things, I can put some ex experience of my, um, of people I met, I can put my own experience, many things, because it's fiction, uh, fiction uh, story. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask that, that's, that, thank you very much for, for answering it so honestly, um, and so personally. It's interesting how much of yourself is in that book. Um, and now I want to ask you the flip side of that question, which is, you know, the, the, a book is obviously in some respects a narcissistic act because it is yourself on the paper, except then you hand it over to these readers and they, they have nothing to do with you. And they put onto the book itself their own imagination, their own projection, mm. their own understanding of what it is. And you now have this whole dialogue going on that you have no control over between yourself and the reader. And you mentioned that you even deliberately like to keep a lot of white space mm. in, your, in your, your, your pictures and on the page to kind of keep open that, that space for the reader. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. I, I have to explain a little thing about comics in general. Uh, you know, between two panels, uh, two frames, uh, there is a white space. It's a moment for the reader to make a cognitive associa association. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, for example, in animation, there is uh, 12 or 24 frames by second. So your mind, your, um, your, brain. your brain is making without conscience uh, the association between the, the frames. But in comics, it's quite different because uh, the moment between uh, image one and image two is um, il y a une, un espace plus grand de temps temporel. Yeah, there's a, uh, a greater temporal space. Une ellipse. One une ellipse temporelle. Une ellipse. An uh, ellipsis. Ellipsis. Yeah, um, ellipsis. So it's the moment the reader has to imagine, even if it's quite unconscious, uh, what is, in, is between two frames. Um, in normal um, comics books, the border of there are some border uh, uh, of, uh, autour de, de l'image uh, around yeah around the image, and uh, for this reason and other reason, I preferred at the time to keep out uh, to to don't leave, uh, to put to remove to remove those borders, and um, one thing uh, is that. Uh, I find the white, uh, peut-être on peut vous montrer une, une image. With, oui, c'est pas euh, celle d'avant, yes. Yeah. The white around. Mm -hmm. Is the reader's white? It's the mm -hmm. place for imagination. And the, there is another reason, just to finish with this, yes, this point, um, is that, you know, Comics is a mix between text and image. It's kind of toujours un problem. De, it's always a problem to mix so different, so different uh, medium. And uh, I would like to. J'ai envie en utilisant le même crayon, celui de l'écriture et celui du dessin, uh, et en enlevant les, les bulles, les, les, les phylactères. Mm -hmm. Uh, de créer plus de connexion encore entre le texte et l'image. So I like, what I like to do, uh, first of all, is to use the uh, same writing implement um, that I use for writing um, for the drawing. And then I also like to remove uh, the bubbles and the borders so that you have this flow. Mm -hmm. And the, second, the, the last reason is when I... Uh, I take off, I um, remove the borders, um, the wall panel um, become like a wall, for example. C'est en fait le fait de, de, 
qu'il n'y ait plus les cases. Les cases font que ça reste une page et le fait d'enlever les, euh, les bordures, enfin les, les bords, mm -hmm. fait que c'est presque comme euh, une peinture sur un mur. Whereas when you uh, remove uh, all of that, um, it's, uh, it's, it's free-floating. Yeah. Do you have the original text here? The the, the book? Uh, I don't know. No? No. Because uh, we are waiting for the, um, for the book in English. It's a very huge book, so I can't, put, I can't take him with uh, me on the flight in the plane. <laughs> Um, now I want to talk to you a little bit about the play that yeah. your book is being turned into um, and how, how the process of translating it from a novel into, onto the theater and onto the stage um, <coughs> is working. For, for instance, the first thing that comes to my mind is there's almost no dialogue. It's mostly inside one woman's head. Yeah. So how does that then get played out on the stage? Yeah, uh, that will be the actors. And I thought about something uh, with the um, with, re with readers, like putting things into them this, themselves. Because the first uh, thing the actress who is going to play Matea said to me was, "I know I don't look like Matea," and that was very strange because I don't know how Matea looks. <laughs> so she has sort of envisioned some that he because she she's so bent over, so she can only see the top, her eyes in the mirror. So I don't know what Matteo looks like. So it was a very strange thing that she has made up her mind that she doesn't look like how I imagined her to look like. Mm -hmm. But um, so even you don't have an image in your mind of, of no. Matteo. And she's been alone for so many years. So I think that she sort of do doesn't know herself because you need other people to get an impression of what you're like. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's. Part of her social anxiety is that she fears that the world will see her, like that she that or she thinks much worse of herself than what the world would probably think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm writing it as a play, and it's not decided yet how it will be. But as I say, a lot of the thoughts have, will have to be a monologue. And but Exelon, they have a lot of dialogues. Her and Exelon, and He is dead. <laughs> in the, the book starts when she's just home from his funeral, but she's still very confused about that, and I wanted the reader to feel the same confusion as she does, so she still talks to him as if he's there. So I know that the actress wants um, an excellent on stage, uh, on the stage too, but he will be like a ghost or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they have their conversations, and and maybe um, even though she has him, I think the dialogue sort of demonstrates how lonely she is because I think he doesn't see how strange she is, and I think that makes her lonely. That if he would have seen her, like yeah, if he would have seen how lonely she is. Yeah, and see but that the strange thing about her is sort of a good thing. And yeah, I mean, that actually goes back to what he was saying. Is I, I definitely felt when reading this, she doesn't know how lonely she is. No. We, as the reader, recognize that this is an incredibly lonely woman. But yeah. she's just simply living her life. Yeah. And so it kind of takes us to make it, it the book work. Because we have to be the ones to see that this life is actually absurd and very strange. I mean, yes. not only was she struck by lightning, she befriends a man who has a watch. No, she has a watch. She befriends a man who's constantly standing on a, in a park holding a banana. Um, she, <laughs> she lets her dog drown because she doesn't want to cause Draw a fuss. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's not socialized in the most um, recognizable way. Mm -hmm. And she does not see that. Only we see that. And that's actually why the humor of the book works very well. Mm -hmm. But it does take us to, to bring that to it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think she would have survived if she no, knew herself how right. lonely she right. was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then she would have drowned. <laughs> <laughs>
many years ago. Right. Before. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should open it up a little bit to the audience and take questions. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I'm very curious since I know you have a book there. What it sounds like in Norwegian, maybe you can read a paragraph in your own language <laughs> and a part that has one of the lines in it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> And I can tell you about, well, the title is Jo fortere jeg går, jo mindre er jeg, which is, means the part I walk, the smaller I am. And that's from my engineering studies, Einstein's relativity theory. And it also fits her because she's so scared of people that she always runs away when she meets someone, and that makes her much smaller than she is, she needs to be. Uh, a rhyme. Well, in Norwegian... Um, the uh, obituaries. We have these awful rhymes, and uh, you know obituaries. <laughs> yeah, really. That's like always. That's so common. Yeah, it's very common, yeah. and I think that maybe we don't have like a language to talk about death. So we use these very stupid rhymes, like uh, heavy the grief. Well, uh, yeah, I can't think of anyone in uh, English. No, I, I didn't really care about translating them. I just or a Norwegian here's a, a Norwegian uh, rhyme from an obituary it's så lukker vi dig i vår hjerte rinn og gjemmer deg innerst inne der skal du fredfullt bo i våre sinn som et kjært og dyrebart minne did it, did it sound like it rhymed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. does anyone else have a question for our panelists? Yes. In the chain, when I find it really interesting. I never really thought about it so much that when you have to translate text, that so many that the translator has to come with a vision that that is similar to what your vision is. Do you find it difficult to find to find that medium where you're not losing any part of your work? And how do you how do you approach those difficulties when you're working with the translator? Est-ce qu'il est difficile de trouver un traducteur en fait, qui, est, qui est sur la même longueur d'onde mm. Comment est-ce que vous, vous abordez les problèmes euh, de sensibilité que vous, que vous pouvez avoir avec, euh, avec un traducteur qui... mm. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait pour qu'il veut yeah. Yeah, well, you have to sort of let it go a bit and realize that it won't be the same book as you wrote yourself. But it's a good thing about letting it belong to someone else, sort of. Yeah. So I, it's a bit painful, but good too. Yeah, I think. Euh, moi je crois que ça fait partie des moments dans la vie où il faut faire confiance euh, aux amis. Euh, le traducteur. Est... Pour, pour, ma, pour Lucie, il était, euh, m'a été très recommandé par des gens. Et je, sais, je savais surtout qu'il avait une, euh, une pratique de la littérature en plus de la bande dessinée. Et ça, c'était, c'était une, une, une très bonne chose. Et après, en fait, malheureusement, je n'ai rencontré que après. Et le, la rencontre et l'échange m'ont permis de vérifier que c'était une personne euh, parfaite pour la traduction de Lucille. Mais c'est toujours un peu... Euh, Il faut faire confiance au départ. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that uh, this is one of the moments in life when you have to let go and put your trust in another person, be it a friend or, or whatever. Um, and um, I, first of all, the person who translated Lucille was someone who has been highly recommended uh, to me and who was someone who already had a great deal of experience in translating both literature and uh, uh, graphic uh, graphic novels, and this I thought was a good thing um, that he had had this uh, dual experience. Uh, unfortunately, I only had the pleasure of meeting him afterwards, but that meeting did uh, uh, confirm to me that in fact he was the perfect translator um, for this work. Which brings me back to the first point that I made: sometimes in life, you just have to trust. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm? Do you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, no, and it's fun, and I love it when they ask me like questions about the smallest things, because then I know that. And it's fun, too, with mistakes when they happen, and then I know that they think Matthias is very strange, like they have translated. She's sitting in a dream with a doll on her lap, 
But in the English version, it said she was sitting there with a duck in her lap. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> they must really think that she's very weird. <laughs> it kind of small for her to sit with a duck in her lap. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you speak very well in English. Have you thought in the future of translating your own work, maybe? Um, well, thank you. Um, no, I... Do. I don't feel it's. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you can comment on my English, and I'm unable to respond. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I have taken part in the translation, but it's hard to. Like, I can say like normal sentences, but I don't know that like normal sayings, and I don't have a big vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So it feels very different from Norwegian, and I feel like. You feel like another person when you speak in another language. Like there's someone sitting yeah. here next to you speaking, not completely yourself, and it's the same. And so I don't think I'm, I speak English well enough to write. Yeah. It, it might be for the for the future because um, I translate my own things, so I write in Spanish and English. Okay. And yeah. What you say, it's like strange. I trust it myself, so I'm being two different people. So maybe yeah. you might trust yourself in the future yeah. to translate something smaller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. Mm. Uh, just a little thing about translation that I remind. Uh, when I received the... When I received the first les premiers travaux du traducteur mm -hmm. avant la publication. When I received uh, the, uh, the first draft of the translation before publication from this translator. J'ai vu qu'il avait uh, enlevé tous les accents, parce qu'il y, y a beaucoup d'accents, des accents picards, les accents italiens, et il y a plusieurs a accents parisiens qui sont dans la bande dessinée que j'ai mis, j'ai donné le, les accents euh, dans le français et qui les avait enlevés. Particularities of different languages that I had put uh, in there. Uh, for example, there is a kind of a Italian character at one point, French character, a Spanish character, and um, personalities. And all of these specific accents had been removed. Just it was just flat English, in other words. Mm -hmm. And so I called him and I said, "Oh, well, it's very different for me." Uh, and he told me that it was different for uh, American people and not very... Um, que c'était un, un très ringard et très... Uh, et que c'était un, un peu vulgaire de, de, de mettre les accents qu'il y avait un, Et surtout, et surtout, et c'est vrai, uh, ce n'est pas... La, un peu, et qu'il y, qu y avait un rapport raciste, exactement, uh, avec cette traduction des accents. Et aussi que l'accent picard, par exemple d'un accent régional de la France, mm -hmm. il aurait fallu le traduire en un accent peut-être du sud des États-Unis, mais de toute façon, ça ne donnait pas la même, la même signification pour un lecteur américain de voir un personnage picard parler avec l'accent du sud. Um, when you uh, imitate people's foreign accents, that was, that's something that's kind of very old-fashioned in the United States and considered vulgar and it's no longer done. And it even has a certain relationship to racism. And so we avoid um, portraying uh, people's uh, foreign accents in English uh, now uh, in America. Uh, furthermore, he said that uh, the accent uh, of uh, Picardy, my region, um, if we translated that into um, some kind of an American accent, we would perhaps be obliged to make it from the southern U.S. Um, and yet, um, having a southern U.S. accent would not have the same meaning to Americans as the PW accent would have to the French. Okay. It's a kind of things you have to do with uh, translation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Another question about your relationship to translation. Uh, in your, your case, so most of the translations have been, I guess, to languages that you have some familiarity with, the other Scandinavian languages in English. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but it seems like you might know some of them. And in your case, uh, they can translate to a bunch of European, but also to Korean. Both of you have commented on some issues or some thoughts that arose when you saw your book translated into English. 
because you are familiar enough to be able to read it and get a sense of it. Do you find that um, your reaction or your response to your Korean translation is obviously, I imagine you don't, you don't know Korean. Mm -hmm. So how, how does that, uh, you know, what is that with the, it's, it's, a, it's a language that you don't even have a comment on, if you will. Uh, whereas for you, uh, you do have a very strong feeling and sense of the line, of the linguistic aspects of the English translation. So I was curious as to how you guys respond to the more familiar languages that it's being translated to, as well as the unfamiliar language that it may be translated into. I can say just shortly. It's been translated into German and Spanish, which I don't know, and that's a relief. I'm like, <laughs> I just decided, I'm, I just say to myself that it's probably great. <laughs> yeah. But I like it when they send me emails with strange questions, or many small, like, they care about the small things. What are some questions about the things that were obvious to you writing it, that you were surprised to hear a German translator ask you about? Well, uh, like, they have all been a bit confused about the air warmers, because they all think it's, are here and then they're like how can it be a pocket on a, an ear warmer and but that wasn't the best example I could think of now but wait yeah. it's not something like this yeah no, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's in Norway when we go skiing and everything we wear these uh, yeah because those would be hard to knit when because hey, she's you know, she, she, she's got talents <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's more like she spends yeah. a lot of her time knitting the yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you really? No, no, a character. Oh, but do you? That's a good question. Do you knit? <laughs> that was the scary thing. I went to this school where everyone was knitting, and I was sitting there, and they were like, you're knitting ear warmers, just like the main character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, be mm. careful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm turning into her. Yeah. Uh, I, I will answer uh, about the, the Korean version. Um, when the translator Korean began, he was in Korea, so he sent me some mails for asking about specific points of my story, uh, especially for um, pour, uh, là je parle d'un autre, uh, not Lucille, but another book uh, with a lot of. Il uh, y avait beaucoup de contes. Uh, populaire que j'avais mis à l'intérieur, très européen, très français. There were um, um, a whole bunch of uh, little traditional French tales that I had put into the into the text. And this is an earlier text, not Lucille. Que j'avais transformé des histoires régionales comme la bête du Gévaudan, par exemple, qui est connue de personne sauf en France. Uh, regional tales that are known by absolutely nobody uh, except French people from that region. Yeah. And je l'avais, I, I sent a lot of mail to try to explain uh, what was inside those stories um, before I, uh, avant, enfin, so, quel était le contenu de ces histoires avant que je m'en serve, c'est-à-dire que je lui avais fait l'histoire, l'historique de, de, uh, de chaque petite histoire avant que moi je m'en serve. Um, I had, um, uh, um looked up, uh, I, I knew the, the background, the history of each of the uh, stories before I would use them in, in, uh, in my book. Et après ça, je lui avais expliqué comment moi je m'en étais servi et quel était le symbolique de, 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 de ce travail. And then what I did was I explained to the Korean uh, uh, translator uh, the um, significance of the story for me, the symbolism, and how I intended to use it in the, uh, in the book. Et... Uh, à un moment, je l'ai rencontré. I met him in Paris. He came for one year in Paris, and uh, we had lot of coffee, and uh, we can di discu uh, discute, uh, discuss. Uh, discuss about the book and so. And so I saw the book is my book. He, he was walking on at the table, and uh, I took the book and I read the book, and it was plenty of quotes uh, everywhere. The notation de de, de notes, il y avait des notes partout sur le livre euh, qu'il avait mis, pas que de traduction, juste 
pour qu'il comprenne chaque chose. Il avait fait un travail de fou, de compréhension et d'histoire. Il avait cherché partout dans des bibliothèques pour comprendre le livre. The book that he was working on, the copy that he was using to work on, was loaded with notes, all kinds of notes. And um, he was uh, not only taking down uh, everything that I said, but he did uh, uh, exhaustive research to the point of being a madman, you know, looking up bibliographical and biographical, um, uh, all kinds of things that, about these uh, stories, so that he could come to a point where he would really understand them. Et bien sûr, je n'ai jamais pu lire ce qu'il avait mis en coréen sur la traduction finale du livre, mais après avoir vu tout ce travail, j'étais très confiant. Okay, well, I think that we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I want to thank you both for being here today. This was really wonderful. Thank you very much.